Hello everyone, my name is Jill. I'm an assistant professor at Iowa State University. I have an appointment with Iowa State University Human Science Extension and Outreach as an aging state specialist. I'm glad to have the chance to speak to you about the community extension programs that we have conducted in the last two years. The title of the presentation is Community Extension Programs for Engaging Old Adults. Let's get started. Before I delve into this topic, I'm going to share a story that you may have heard about. Please read the, uh, the Mary story. Okay, um, sounds familiar. As you can imagine, Mary's situation is not foreign to us. In fact, many older Iowans prefer to live and to age in their own place rather than moving into other facilities or nursing homes. What do these old adults do when they are still healthy and independent and live in their own home? If they want to age in place rather than moving into facilities, what are the steps old adults need to do or to, um, what are the steps they need to take to make sure that they receive the care they need in their home? Today, we'll discuss our efforts to address this issue how to help old adults to navigate their care network as well as their current living environment. As I mentioned earlier, when we get older, we need help or coordination in several areas. Their house may need some modification. The cooking situation may not be ideal. Also, they may need some help and guidance in making health or financial decisions. Let's begin first defining what the future care planning means, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Future care planning is defined as consideration of financial, medical, personal, health, and environmental support for future needs due to chronic illness or health events that would threaten their independence. That is, Future care planning can be broadly defined as an information seeking and decision making framework with the purpose of maintaining good quality of life as old adults face health events and care needs. Then you may wonder why future care planning? Why is it necessary? Well, research has shown several negative outcomes without having any future care planning but also the studies show that there are positive outcomes with future care planning as well. In particular, changes in health cognition, social network in later life often result in health incidents or sudden loss or need for personal care for many, many old adults. This sequence often lead to the negative mental health outcomes such as increased worry and anxiety. It can also lead to financial and personal loss. Think about the most abrupt and impulsive decision you had to make due to some circumstances in the past. How did it turn out? Most likely, without proper and careful planning and strategies, our sudden decisions are likely to cost more. The sequence from health events to significant change in later life is called disablement process. And we'll discuss this in the next slide. So again, what are the real consequences of not planning ahead? This cascade effect from illness to disablement process has been noted in the literature. In particular, prior studies have indicated that minor health incidents such as fall or ear visits often accelerate the process of disablement and also moving to assisted living facilities. So it starts one little slip, but it can have this domino effect from one fall to disablement, as well as moving into the facilities without proper or without enough preparation or time. Because of the crisis mode without proper preparation, older adults often start to feel anxious and feel ready uh, in times of need. Let's go back and look at the statistics showing the context of older adults living in a community. 
In the national level, in the recent survey by AARP, majority of old adults over the age of 65 indicated they wish and they prefer to remain in their current residence or stay in their community as long as possible. It was number one by far. However, we know that most old adults are needing care before reaching frailty in later life, as the limitation in the basic functioning with cognitive issues increase with older age. In fact, between age 80 and 90 years old, more than half of old adults are receiving currently uh, family cares help, family caregivers help, usually, uh, usually spouse or their adult children. But when they're asked, most old adults reported that they saw the need, but delayed their future care planning in the past. These challenges are more pronounced in the rural state. Especially in Iowa, most old adults do not have their family, especially adult children living nearby. Lack of social support combined with the scarce resources contributed to the challenges rural old adults are facing. In addition, the lack of community-based program or education opportunity that could help them to age in place or to live independently with minimal care. These community programs addressing these issues can make old adults aware of unanticipated challenges and undesired treatment options. The Plan Ahead program is anchored in this proactivity theory by Dr. Kahana and Kahana who suggested that uh, proactive behaviors help old adults prepare for potential future stressors, such as declining health or increasing disability. So this program is based on the idea that people can plan their own care by proactively preparing for future events instead of reacting, coping with a health crisis or aging challenges afterwards. In other words, instead of reacting to the stressors and challenges, we can prepare and cope with the potential challenges ahead of time by building resources and navigating options for care. This is called proactive adaptations. And it is, um, is um, the, this proactive adaptation means assisting old adults to mobilize resources and engaging in planning activities for their health care and then frailty in later life. These activities will include changing, revising your home environment, assessing your health care needs, and sharing your health financial decision with your loved ones in case of emergency and health events. Now let's look into the actual FCP, future care planning programs. So based on this prior work on the productivity, Iowa State University Human Science Extension implemented this program with rural old adults who are often lacking in resources and information. The protocol consists of two sessions, as you can see on, um, on the table. In particular, the session one emphasized the importance of future care planning and helping old adults to prepare for health events and marshalling support from formal and informal health. We also utilize health communication modeling by including interactive activities. We also show several ways to compile toolkits preparing for their health events and natural disaster situation. We just experienced an unprecedented direct code, and this is a perfect example how our safety kit can be used to cope with emergency situations such as a power outage. Session two is rather focusing more on the end of life care and healthcare related decision. We also explore the co community resources and share the tips to find available resources outside of their community. These activities are intended to help old adults assess their current uh, situation, as well as to consider other living options. The session, again, uh, utilized several learning uh, strategies such as modeling, motivation, and proactivity. Let me share the sample curriculum a bit, a bit to give you more context. The first session starts with a program introduction 
and the pretest based assessment. Then we watch a video about how to be a smart patient, a funny short film describing the patient's visit to doctor's visit. Then we will have some discussion about the film and what it means to be a healthy, smart patient. And then share some tips to increase a proactive health visit. After that, facilitators demonstrate how to build two types of uh, toolkit, safety and comfort kit for health visits and some natural disaster preparation. The session ends with assignment, uh, uh, asking participants to look over the My Documents, the briefcase that we distribute, and shadowing the second session while we will discuss. Again, you can see the basic activities participants will do and ask to complete in their own time. These activities are assessed again by the second assessment and the one month follow up. Okay, so these are the study aims that we had uh, for this study. So we wanted to determine the acceptability and feasibility of the program. We also wanted to assess the effectiveness of the program. And finally, wanted to see whether the program satis was satisfying for participants as well as their uh, facilitators. We also used the following measure to assess feasibility and acceptability of the program and program impact on psychological state among participants. So we asked the program satisfaction and we asked the difficulty in implementation, changes in opinions about the future care planning, worry about future care planning, and whether the program reduced the worry about future care. In terms of assessing future care planning activities, we asked the following, whether they had a conversation with doctors about future care planning, whether they have had a discussion with friends and family about future care planning, preparing the list of a medication, and finally, preparing the list of contact persons in case of emergency. We did, we did ask this question beforehand, before we start the program. It is interesting to note that most participants had prepared a medication list in the past and completed a list of contact persons for healthcare. And more than half of the participants, 50%, had discussed FCP, future care planning, with their family and friends beforehand. But it was interesting that only 29% uh, of the participants had discussed how to prepare for their future care with their doctors. We also assessed the resource building af after the program. Um, after the program. Um, participants reported whether they reviewed the information in their My Document briefcase and whether they started assembling a comfort bag as a preparation for hospital or ER visits. Participants' resource seeking was also measured before each session and the second follow-up. They reported whether they compared different community options for obtaining health, uh, help uh, or care in the future and whether they gather information about options for care by talking to their family members. Participants were also asked to report their level of competence in preparation for future care before the first session of the program. So the level of a participant's competence was measured using these three items with the binary options. The level of competence was calculated by summing their answers to these three items. All participants who met the inclusion criteria were asked to participate. The inclusion criteria were um, age, 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 um, adults age 60s and over, and also they had to live independently in the community. They should speak English, uh, speak and write in English, and express a willingness to take part both in person and phone surveys. We conducted this community extension programs at Iowa State University Extension Outreach Office or any local organizations such as church or library that old adults could easily access. Corporate extension specialists recruited participants from the community and led the sessions. We collected the data from the participants using self-administered questionnaires and short follow-up te short, short follow telephone questions. After the screening procedure, 
we found uh, we had a 234 eligible participants at baseline. As I said, uh, we use the competence measures and based on that measure, we split the pay uh, participants in half. So half of them were considered as high competence, the other half were low competence. Generally, high competence group were more likely to be older, white, female, and less likely to be married. Their health status was also better than the low competence group. Inter interestingly, there are no differences in education level. As mentioned earlier, we were specifically targeting rural old adults, but some specialists were eager to recruit urban areas, so include them as well. We used ISU, uh, Iowa State University indicator portal to differentiate rural and urban area. The stars on the map roughly indicate where the program was implemented. We consider the dark shade, darkest shade about 34,000 people or more per county as urban. In general, we pilot the study uh, across 20 different sites, half urban and half rural. So you can see that our study was split pretty evenly across urban and rural context. So our first aim is to determine the acceptability and feasibility of the program. Given that we were interested to learn that whether the program was similarly received um, on the, based on the competence level, I'll present the findings based on these two group differentiation. So as you can see, we found that most participants, regardless of their competence level, reported that they perceive a high need for future care planning after the program. This shows that core idea of future care planning was acceptable for most participants. In terms of feasibility, most participants rated that it was not that difficult. As expected, a higher competence group reported lower levels of difficulty in implementing the program compared to the low competence group, although the difference was not significant. Both groups also rated the program provided much needed and useful information and there was no difference between these two groups. Our second aim of the study was the actual impact of the program by assessing effective effectiveness of the program. Specifically, we examined the implementation of planning activity. So we kind of changed, uh, were assessed, uh, assessing the behavior change over time. Also, we changed, uh, we examined the changes in worry and attitudes towards future care planning. As a repeated measure general linear model analysis show the significant changes in the number of um, activities across three time points. And I'm presenting the same results, but just breaking down to the competence level. Although the compilation rates were higher for high competence group, you can see that both groups show significant change over time in completing future care planning activities. In terms of resource building, we have observed a significant change across time points, regardless of the competence level. For making their comfort bags in case of healthcare emergencies, 40% of the high competence group and 42% of the low competence group assembled a comfort bag according to the suggestions in the program. Similar patterns were found in reviewing my brief case document, including advanced care directive documents. After the completion of the program, majority of the high competence group, 95%, and low competence group, 95%, received the document and reviewed the documents and made their my document brief cases. The McNamara test revealed the percentage of participants who search for community resources and options um, significantly increased, and it was for both groups. Similarly, in the base assessment, 70% of the high competence group and 38% of the low competence group had discussed healthcare information with the family. After the completion of the program, both groups reported increase in their discussion with family members, but the change was more pronounced in the low competence group. 
Now let's look at the psychological impacts such as changing attitudes and worry. In terms of attitudes about the future care planning, after the first session, 51% of the participants reported that their opinions have changed. The results of McNamara suggest that participants' thoughts towards future uh, planning for the future care were changed significantly between the first and second follow-up for both groups. The program also reduced worry about the future care planning. So both groups reported less worry about the program after the completion of the program. So for low competence group, 18% reported still worry about future care planning compared to 11% of the high competence group before the program. But after the program, 35% of both groups reported that programs reduced their worry significantly. The third aim of the study was to examine the program satisfaction with the program. We wanted to determine in particular whether the satisfaction with the program varied by the competence level of the participants. I'm including both facilitators report as well, but if you look at the lower bar, the participants report on program satisfaction uh, was pretty much like 4.5. And if you look at the facilitator's report on satisfaction, and it actually scored from one to four for the facilitator side. Um, as you can see, both uh, facilitator and participant, uh, they were both satisfied with the programs. So in conclusion, the results of this pilot study you know, suggest that future care planning is a feasible intervention that promoted proactive planning competencies in old adults. Interestingly, we found that acceptance and feasibility was similarly found regardless of the competence level among participants. A critical question is how long these improvements last. Although our short-term follow-up shows promising results, we need to uh, address the sustainability of the effectiveness with the longer follow-up. Fi finally, I'd like to point out that this was not a randomized controlled trial. So it would be nice to have a little uh, RCT, uh, randomized controlled trial, to evaluate the comparative effectiveness. And there are several caveats and limitations of this study that is worth to mention. First, the findings are limited to Iowa, so it needs to be replicated in other states as well. Second, we do not have any control group. Again, this change that we have observed could have been just due to natural change. Third, even in the state of Iowa, we do not control for any regional, uh, regional differences. We are planning to look at the uh, differential uptake of the intervention depending on the disparity in resources across regions in the future. Fourth, we did some racial differences in the uptake of intervention, but it was somewhat a reflection of the baseline differences. In fact, uh, one of my students actually put um, racial difference uh, is actually take a look at the racial differences in future care planning. Finally, I cannot emphasize enough about the importance of facilitators competence. There are extension outreach specialists whose teaching experience is over 20 years old, and their level of competence may have contributed to the successful implementation and outcomes of the study. In case if you're interested in our references, here are the list of the publications that I have included in the study. And I'd like to acknowledge the following. Iowa State University Extension Outreach, who sponsored the program, an extension field specialist who facilitated the program, and they are the real champions. And I'd like to thank three students who have worked on the data coding analysis and helping out many tasks, Dahi, Luis, and Natasha. Thank you. And thank you for your attention. And I will open up the, um, the room for the questions.